introduce you and our next speaker to you. And we'll do a quick swapsy of laptops there. Um, so, uh, Lena Pl uh, Plexina. Um, I actually know Lena because we both spoke together at Kiwi Ruby back in 2017, so I already have very good evidence that she's a fantastic speaker. Um, she's going to be talking to us about writing her own programming language. Um, she's an avid cat rescuer, a learning enthusiast, and in the and is on the organizing committee for Railsbridge Wellington. She started out in design, but fell for web and software development during her first industry internship. She's been writing Ruby since 2015, and she's currently learning other language to ex languages to expand her toolkit. She loves finding patterns, building and communicating software in a way that helps everyone understanding it, and you know, believes in failing better and mistakes making as better developers. When she's not coding, she's watching movies with her three-legged rescue cat, Warlock. Adorable, I always love the animal facts. Um, those of you who came last year may be aware of that. <laughs> uh, she also loves collecting enamel pens and helping out or presenting at tech community events around town. So please make Lena very welcome. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. I'm going to try to be super chipper because we're back from a break and it's day two and it's going to be rad. So to start us off, to get us in the spirit of things, I was thinking we'd play a bit of a game. Now, if any of you are familiar with a game called Animal, Vegetable, or Mineral, it's kind of like that, except it's nothing like that in the sense that it's not a game show, and you just have to think of the answer and keep it on your head. So I'm going to think of a thing, and I'm going to give you three clues to guess what it is. And so we're going to go from there and see how things shake out. So clue number one, it's that the thing I'm thinking of, the concept I'm thinking of, it has something to do with the sea. I'll give you a second to think, but I feel like this is a very unfair clue in the sense that there is literally thousands of things that have to do with the sea. So if you happen to guess it right on this first try, that's amazing and uncanny. So I'll give you a clue number two promptly. A clue number two is that in addition to having to do with the sea, this also has something to do with pigs. Now I know that I made it too easy, and by now everyone already knows what I'm thinking about, so I might as well give you clue number three, as that I cheated, and it's not actually full-grown pigs, it's piglets. So no point drawing it out, I know everyone knows what, it, what this is, so I'm just going to go ahead Obviously, I'm thinking of Das Meerschwänchen, Marskaya Svinka, you know, sea piglets, clearly, this one right here. <laughs> so in Germany and in Russia, these fluffy little creatures are known as sea piglets in a literal translation. But if your native language doesn't happen to be either of those things, you might recognize the animal in the photo as a guinea pig. Now, all of that is to say that language cultivates meaning. I personally was born in Russia, and I spoke Russian exclusively and no other languages for the first 10 years or so of my life. So I'm an immigrant, I'm an English as a second language speaker, and most of the time, this small fact just manifests in me having a slightly unusual accent, driving small talk, things like that, people asking me about beers, which I don't know anything about, um, but sometimes what this means is that when I'm trying to have a conversation with someone or deliver a fancy talk at an overseas conference, uh, some words or sometimes even entire phrases will drop out of my brain completely and they will be unhelpfully replaced by the same concept but in a different language to what I'm actually trying to use. And uh, usually that other language is my native Russian, but sometimes it's German because I studied German in high school for a while and I went on exchange there. So why would somebody like me conceptualize guinea pigs as little piglets from the seas or bats as mice that fly? You know, I've, I've been speaking English for a really long time and I know what concepts are attached to the words, to the words guinea pig, to the words bat. Um, but the language that I first heard be used to describe those concepts formed really strong links in my brain and cultivated really different thinking. In the 1960s, a person called Melvin Conway created this theory 
and a small summary basically goes, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. And that's a mouthful, <laughs> but I think it's a very academic way of saying that we make products that reflect the teams that wrote them. And I would like to take that a bit further and propose that maybe if you happen to be writing a language, you'll be writing one that reflects the writer. I'd also say that we join communities that reflect their personal ethos by extension from a similar kind of concept. But all of that stuff is really interesting, um, but I don't think you're here to learn about Conway's theory. Uh, I don't think you're here to hear about my origin story either. So it's about time that I tell you a little bit about Wholesome Lang. Now, Wholesome Lang is the name of the language that I tried writing. I started doing this nearly two years ago now, I think. Um, and it started as a joke about my speaking patterns. So in my regular life, I am a pretty silly person. I say a lot of silly things. I make up silly words. And uh, my friends like to tease me about it and make jokes. Uh, one year for my birthday, they got me like an English dictionary but they inserted entries with the silly words that I say that everybody's picked up into the dictionary, and it was like English plus Lena, and it was really cute. Uh, so because I am the kind of person that I am, I decided to take the joke a little bit too far and write an entire language around it, and uh, that's what I decided to do, just to make something that would make me laugh, that would make my friends laugh, and pick up on this long-running joke I wanted to be cute, kind of like an esoteric language, and I thought I would base it on object-oriented kind of paradigms and implement it in Ruby because I love Ruby. I think it's really fun and uh, brings me a lot of joy. So um, that also meant that I didn't have to learn a whole bunch of new tech while trying to learn a thing that I've never tried to do. So my friend Ben helped me to get started, and I had a look through some tutorials online. And at the time, I thought all of this was going to be really difficult. Um, but it turned out that, like most things, I could choose to make it as simple or as difficult as I wanted. So one of the tools that I used a lot was, or guides rather, was this article from freecodecamp.org. It was uh, one of my main references for a whole bunch of concepts that I ended up using. Uh, the author is very helpful. They go in detail through the things that they've done to implement their own language and why they made the decisions that they made and what the alternatives were. And basically, they just give you a whole bunch of super solid advice that anybody writing a language would just be so well served in using. So um, naturally, I didn't follow most of it. Uh, because I wasn't planning on solving great technological challenges with Wholesome Lang. And um, unlike Pinecone, which is the language in the tutorial that I just mentioned, Wholesome Lang wasn't concerned about things like runtime speed or performance or anything else like that. I chose to forego steps like writing my own compiler or even using a compiled language as the tool for Wholesome Lang to speed up performance. Uh, I mean, granted, listening to the talks yesterday, maybe it's not such a big deal with Ruby being super fast now, but I don't know. Uh, ultimately, it didn't matter because none of that was what I was um, optimizing for. The only thing that I personally was optimizing for with Wholesome Lang was having fun. So I wrote the whole thing in Ruby. Uh, I made it an interpreted language, sitting on top of an interpreted language. And I think all of you should immediately go download it and use it in your production projects. <laughs> now, um, one recommendation that I did keep from the tutorial is uh, creating my own custom tokenizer. So a little bit about what I discovered about what powers languages underneath. There's two really cool components. I mean, there's a lot more, but two really cool components that I ended up using in Wholesome Lang. One of them is the tokenizer, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as Elixir. And this is basically the piece of your program that will interpret the source code that you provide it with and turn those sets of symbols into tokens that the rest of the program can recognize. 
And the other piece is a parser, which is responsible for building the um, abstract syntax tree for the rest of your program to interpret. Now, um, to kind of show what that means in reality, uh, I'd say that the main reason why a language, well, maybe not the main, but one of the main reasons that a language benefits from having a tokenizer is because that introduces an agent in the middle for deciphering what the individual blocks of symbols actually represent and what type of thing is eventually supposed to process them. And because of a tool like the tokenizer, the parser down the road doesn't need to worry about trying to pull valid or legitimate tokens out of the source code. It can just consume them. So if we were to think of something slightly analogous, it's not quite right, but it's close enough. In the Rails world, um, think about how when you're using your controller, the controller doesn't have to worry about um, you know, trying to pull legible params out of the HTTP request because something else has already done that work beforehand. Your control doesn't have to worry about form structures or whatever else it might be. It just has the thing that it needs. And this is kind of what's going on here. So in Wholesome Lang, my tokenizer does the brunt of the work, but underneath it's actually pretty simple. When I'm identifying the tokens, uh, basically what I'm doing is regex matching. So I cycle through all of the descendants of the token class until I find the descendant whose identifying expression matches the particular thing in the window that I'm looking at, the particular set of symbols. And then I assign the correct token type to that set of symbols. So this piece here was one of the very first internals of Wholesome Lang that I actually ended up writing. And uh, yeah, I felt pretty good about it. And it did this magical thing where once I started writing it, and I was like, cool, I wrote a tokenizer, elixir, you know? Feel pretty good. I started realizing a whole bunch of things about languages, like programming languages, and what it takes to write them. Now, for starters, and this might feel really intuitive or basic, but I realized that a programming language is just another program. And like all other programs, it has a main runner, and that main runner will take arguments, for example, the file that you would like to execute. Now, Wholesome Lang hasn't been packaged or shipped as like a thing that you can install on your machine so that you could just put it in the path and you know, just go, Wholesome Lang, do the thing. So for me to run it on my machine, I'm going, Hey, Ruby, grab wholesome lang and then run the thing. But essentially, all of them underneath are doing the same thing. It's just obscured. Now, another thing, like all other programs that a language runner can do is take a set of flags. Uh, it could set up some variables that it needs for executing the rest of the program. So here you can see uh, wholesome lang trying to get through a file called samples pist. Dot WL, and it's got a whole bunch of fl flags there, and it's showing you the things that it's setting up. Now, another thing that it does that's very important is uh, running your necessary checks and validations and reject invalid rude data. Uh, I also realized that with this slide, I'm making it look a lot worse than it is. Uh, the screaming cat is over the word but, so <laughs> but that's not wholesome and wholesome length, so you, you can't just put buts up there. So overall, the, uh, the flow of the whole program, of Wholesome Lang as a program, is pretty simple. Uh, at the very start, file contents get passed to the tokenizer. Then the tokenizer, before doing any other work at all, decides if it's wholesome. And as you saw in the slide before, if it's not wholesome, we raise a critical root, and we're just don't go any further after that. But if it is wholesome, we pass the tokens to the parser. We create the tokens, pass them to the parser. The parser builds a tree, and then we execute the tree by walking down the nodes and the descendants. So now that you know a little bit about how wholesome lang works underneath and what it kind of takes to get into that, I'll tell you a little bit about what it can actually do. I fear warning, I realized that before I said I started this like two years ago, but also that's not like two years of developing it every day. <laughs> this is a very small subset of functionality. But even with the small feature set, uh, I found that in a way I was like playing a game of things that I valued. 
Now, one concept that I value a lot is debugging. So it follows that probably the most complete set of functionality and wholesome lang revolves around the concept of debugging. So this is help text from wholesome lang. Um, when I'm debugging, I have a whole bunch of different flags that you can pass in to run different checks and have a look at what's going on underneath. Um, when we were first getting started, when Ben was helping me out, we invested a lot of time up front into kind of carving out a bunch of different windows into the inner workings of the parser and of the tokenizer to make it as easy as possible for us to figure out what particular ways we messed up in, because we messed up all the time, of course. Um, all of that said, this part is pretty predictable. Um, a lot of programs have flags and debugging features. It's not super exciting. So let's have a look at some of the features with personality and flavor. So from the start, I found myself implementing features that I thought were really funny, and that was kind of the driving force. I wasn't implementing like the next most useful thing. I would just go, that, that's hilarious, let's put that in there. So the very first thing uh, that I ended up implementing is that the first native function I have in there is that my language lets you type pst, and that will print to your console. So that it kind of feels like you're covertly communicating with a friend. And I thought this was really funny. Obviously, most of you don't think that's really funny, but <laughs> that's all good. Um, another thing, this is a work in progress at the moment, but um, when I was thinking about objects in my OO language, uh, you think about things like classes. And I found classes, I think it's a really loaded word, I'm not a big fan, so I decided to call them friends instead, kind of borrowing the internet spelling of the word friend. And to initialize a new friend, you get to meet them. So I think it's really cute. And as you've seen before, my language will not run if the source code contains any swears or insults. And uh, there is a surprisingly complicated thing powering this that um, one of my friends would refer to that as an extremely long walk for an extremely short drink of water. So um, if you want to hear about how that works, <laughs> you know, chat to me in the break. It's pretty funny. But I will tell you that because of how it works, my language will not let you write unwholesome code, not just in English, but in a whole bunch of other languages, I, I believe including Klingon. So, you know, that's cool. So as we've seen, my programming language was reflecting my spoken language. And that in turn, I was finding was reflecting my thought patterns. And I was seeing this reflection manifesting in a whole bunch of ways. Now, of course, at the very kind of top level, uh, I was reflecting my thinking conceptually. So for example, when I was first learning about things like object encapsulation, my mentor was trying to kind of teach me that concept through getting me to imagine the objects that I was working with as sentient beings that can have jobs and that can feasibly know about a thing. And that would kind of teach me to keep things in places that would make it make sense. And obviously I took that to heart because when I started writing my language, I was like, yes, sentient beings, all my classes are friends, we get to meet them, this is chill. And that got baked really deep into wholesome lang because that's how I think. But it was also reflecting my thinking technically uh, I found myself making a whole bunch of assumptions just because that's how I write code. So that's what I did. For example, what you see on the screen now is the actual source code from the file .wl. So this is um, printing some hello from wherever. So you can see the assignment here. The assignment operator has spaces on either side. And that's what I do. I put spaces on either side of assignment operators when I write code. So naturally, when I was writing the rejects for an assignment operator, I was like, yeah, it's an equal sign with spaces on either side, obviously. And then somebody else tried to run it on their computer, and they were like, I can't assign any variables. What's going on? And I was like, ah, oh, that's what's going on. Fair enough. Uh, another thing I assumed was that um, there would always be a new line at the end of a program, and that's how we would know that we 
we can stop. And uh, why wouldn't I assume that? My, my editor automatically puts in a new line at the end. I, I didn't even think to check it because it, it doesn't even, I can't even make it happen because of the settings of my editor. And we ran it on Ben's computer and we we're like, why is this breaking? And we're like, oh yeah, that's why. Lena, not everybody writes code like you, what are you doing? So um, as somebody who really enjoys Ruby, I really enjoy a lot of the things that Matt has to say about Ruby. I really love this quote where he says, I started out to make a programming language that would make me happy. And as a side effect, that's made many, many programmers happy. I think that's so cute and it definitely makes me happy. But I also think it speaks to the fact that when we're writing a language, we are influencing our community. So languages are very much a product of their creator. So they, as such, will create the, create, they will reflect the creator's values and preferences and personality. And you can see this come through really strongly in something like Wholesome Lang, because from my values and worldview of how I even see classes or friends to my preferences with putting spaces in random places, and my personality with just the absurdity of the whole thing, it definitely reflects that. You'll see that operations and features that the creator will find useful a lot of the time will be really easy and intuitive in whatever language they write. So basically, a lot of the time it's the thing that makes them happy. So programming languages, they're like a thing that we use to communicate with our machines, right? So when we write new programming languages, we're just writing alternative tools for communicating with our machines. I, mean, I would argue no, not at all. I, I don't think my machine cares in the least if I'm using Wholesome Lang or if I'm using Ruby or if I'm using C Sharp or whatever it is. My computer doesn't care. It will all turn into bytecode or zeros and ones or whatever have you. So if it doesn't care what language I'm using, and if programming languages aren't about the machine, what are they about? I'd argue that when we're writing one of these new tools or when we're choosing to use one of these new tools, it's because we are trying to find ways that make sense to us to communicate with other developers. And a lot of the time, other developers is just us in a few months' time. You know, if you've ever experienced that thing where you're looking at a piece of code and you're like, well, why? Who, what's going on here? Why, why did they do this? Who did this? And then you go get blame and you're like, oh, I did this. Who was I three months ago? I don't know. Uh, so I would say that when we're writing new languages or when we're using new languages, it's all about exchanging ideas for comprehension and for reuse and finding ways that make sense to us. Well, for me personally, what follows from all of that is that if my computer doesn't care, and if what I'm doing with my language is communicating with other people, thinking about all the people in the world, how come we're only doing it in English? My first interaction with the web happened when I was in my early tweens. Uh, I lived with my grandmother in Russia, and it was like the very early 2000s, and we had super, super slow dial-up internet on like a machine that my dad made for us. <laughs> and back then, I would go online to look up song lyrics so that I could like write them down in my notebooks, because that's the kind of kid I was. And our internet speed was really slow, and it was very, very expensive. So a lot of the time, what I would do to kind of cheat the system so I'd connect long enough to uh, click view source on whatever I was trying to grab lyrics from, and then I disconnect really fast because the source piece would load really fast, and basically I, it wouldn't have the client wouldn't have to worry about rendering the fancy stuff, you know, the um, the gifs with the glitter and the cycling banners and stuff, and none of that on the dial-up speed, and so I could avoid running up my grandma's utility bills, which was pretty good. So for me, because that was my experience, I have really vivid memories of the web that looked mostly like this. 
So you may or may not recognize this, but um, when I was researching this talk, I came across an article that was reflecting on 30 years of the World Wide Web. And in that article, they linked in the earliest known web page. And they linked it in complete with its source code, which is what you see on the screen. So the author of that article spent some time reflecting on what the web would have meant to native English speakers if uh, it wasn't all written in English. Um, because it didn't have to be, right? There were heaps of other people working on these things. So what if, uh, in turn, instead of seeing this, they saw something more like this? So this is the same page. And I don't know if you recognize what the substitution is. But this, what the substitution is, is that all the HTML tags have been translated to Russian. And the author of the article, to my knowledge, didn't speak the language. They were using, I believe, some tooling to generate this page so that they would illustrate a point and show something to other native English speakers. But I'm a native Russian speaker. And for me, this did something. I wasn't ready to see this. Uh, made my heart jump. And looking at this and connecting it with the memories I had of me being a tween copying down lyrics, I started thinking, what if teenage me saw this instead when she was looking up song lyrics? Would it have meant that I would have started coding sooner? Would it have meant that I would have engaged with this sooner? What would I have made in that extra 10 years? And I don't know. I don't have the answers to any of those questions. But what I do know for a fact is that all programming demands a level of translation. And as developers, as coders, every single one of us is a speaker of other languages. Our daily jobs require us to translate ideas and concepts that we keep in our heads into languages that we know. And I know that for me, for somebody whose native language is not English, there is an extra layer to this and an extra step in the middle. If guinea pig were a common programming word, somebody like me would have to put in some extra work between thinking of the concept of a guinea pig and imagining a guinea pig, and then coming up with the correct term to use in my program that my program could interpret and that my computer could interpret. And even if I were to learn to code without ever learning English, if guinea pig were a common coding keyword, I would still have to memorize the shape of the word guinea pig. So essentially, it would still be the same layer of translation. I just have to translate the word into the shape that I recognize so that then it could be trans translated again into something my machine will understand. So before I started working with Wholesome Lang and doing this silly thing, I was thinking, I always, for some reason in my head, thought that these everyday tools that we use, like programming languages, they're just some like magical and accessible faraway domain of geniuses. Like people in fancy academic labs are creating them. <laughs> and it wasn't until I started thinking about writing Wholesome Lang and looking into what it actually takes that I started seeing these tools as being kind of within my reach. So I became really curious. Um, and I was thinking, how did other languages start out? Was it the same deal, or is it just that it so happens that I started doing this thing that took the easy path? So it took to learn about a language that I see as being very serious. <laughs> And I found out that even Java, which is, I think, wildly regarded as being pretty serious and pretty enterprise, we have a lot of stuff that we use every day that runs on it. Apparently, once it was basically somebody's passion project as well, more or less. So in 1991, Java was still called Green Talk. And it was being worked on by just a handful of people. Uh, Patrick Knowlton, Mike Sheridan, James Gosling, and co. were working to try to introduce some simplicity to C and C++ syntax and make something that's platform independent. And I just had a handful of other people that were interested in the same thing. 
But by the time that most of the rest of us got to see Java as Java, a lot of the time it was through universities or through workplaces, um, it was fairly sophisticated. Certainly by the time that I saw it, with thousands of hours of work put into it. I mean, after all, counting from Java's official release, it's now 24 years old and significantly older still if you count from its green tool days. So it didn't start out mature, it didn't start out well formed, it didn't start out popular. It started out as something that this group of developers were building so that they would have a tool that was based on things that they valued. So if something like Java could have ended up being green talk or oak or realistically even nothing at all, if it didn't end up being finished or released, writing a brand new language suddenly didn't seem so out of reach to me either. And the more I thought about it, the more I started thinking that maybe the question of who can write a programming language can almost come down to who has things to say. I know that for me, I'm not a linguist, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. I'm not an etymologist, I'm not trained in programming language theory or anything of the sort. I'm a Ruby developer. Uh, I wanted to make something that would make me and my friends laugh. And that's basically my entire and complete list of credentials for writing wholesome lang. And the more I thought about it, the more I started thinking about how our whole entire world, everything that we use, everything that we interact with, was built by a bunch of people who had some ideas. And sometimes those ideas gained traction and attracted similar-minded folk and grew bigger and bigger, and more people became familiar with them. So at the end of the day, I made Wholesome Lang for me, I made it for my friends. It's as a silly joke. But I really hope that hearing about what I've done and maybe playing with it uh, inspires you to give it a go as well. I hope that you try writing your own programming language. And I hope that if you do go for it, when you write your own language, it's one that's just your type. <laughs> Thank you.